Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We pray that uh, as we look to it now, that you would uh, just be among us as teacher, that you would quicken our hearts for love of you, and Father, pray that we would learn uh, how better to love you, to follow you, to uh, love one another too. We pray in Jesus' name. Uh, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 15, it's on uh, page 1674 of my Bible, uh, that's no help whatsoever to you by start, mention anyway, uh, but uh, uh, if you've got any, it might be helpful, so I'm just going to refer it to a number of occasions, I might not be able to look up and down. Uh, just a couple of questions that I, I want to think through with you this morning. Um, can anyone become a Christian? Uh, question one. Um, does the church put people off? Question two. Yeah. Does the church make people want to leave? Question three. Uh, hopefully we'll explore that and, and the answers are in Acts 15, I think. Uh, a friend who uh, had a, a big signpost outside the church, had a church building, uh, him, and uh, uh, it had uh, everybody welcome and somebody had been there with a can of spray paint and had put afterwards if dot 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 uh, interesting interesting response to a kind of a what we believe about ourselves and actually what other people believe about ourselves and of course uh, that's also uh, an issue that has been going right back since uh, some of the very earliest beginnings of the Christian faith, and we see a little bit of that being played out in Acts chapter 15. They want to know, in a sense, uh, who is welcome. Uh, and of course, because the, the Christian church started in Jerusalem, um, and uh, there was all kinds of cultural um, expectations around that early church, there are some who wanted the church to continue to be a Jewish church. Uh, if you want some background to read afterwards, it, it's, uh, it's good to go into Galatians, where uh, Paul kind of tackles these very same issues um, in uh, Galatians, the early chapters of Galatians. He references um, in chapter 1 his visit to Jerusalem, um, but he helps with them to address the issues. And he says, you know, who has bewitched you is one of the statements that you see. Uh, to the Christians. Because, of course, uh, the people were saying, well, look, it's great that, you know, Jesus has died and risen from the dead, but actually, you know, we serve a holy God. We love a holy God. Uh, and those laws were given for our purity so that uh, we could, in a sense, honour him. Uh, and therefore, it's really right that anybody that comes to Jesus uh, needs to be able to, to follow these uh, rules about uh, how you live and worship a uh, holy gods. So let's not just think that their their um, kind of their attitudes and what they were saying was in in any sense. Oh well, we're trying to make things different. No, they they were really wrestling with how do we live in a society that's very very different, and how can we honour the holy god that we serve? And and there are two things. Uh, I think that Paul helps them think through in their dialogue. We don't have the dialogue. But the first one is when he talks about the fact that he, when he talks about the laws of God as a yoke about our, our, around our neck. And he says, you know, we couldn't live up to it. And, and he articulates this in Romans. You need to read uh, Romans and Paul on the, the law in Romans to have a snapshot of his argument. But basically what he's saying is, the law is given so that we can be obedient to God. The law was given so we realise actually how God's standards are so high that the only way we can come before Him is by grace, because God treats us as we don't deserve. And, and, and therefore, as we said, actually, do you not realise we, we can't live up to this? So there's a kind of a, a failure, in a sense, to understand the gospel of grace here. But also, there is an outworking that he says, what you're doing is that you are turning the gospel of grace into a gospel of Jesus and. Jesus and. And of course, it's not like that. 
Verse 1 makes it really, really clear that um, you know you can't be saved unless you do this and this and this. And, and he's saying, no, that's just not the way it is. The gospel at the heart of it, it is that actually you come to him by grace alone. And that's really, really important. And it's vital that, that we grasp that in a sense, because it helps us understand the wonder and the beauty of the gospel. So, can anyone be saved? Can anyone become a Christian? Yes, absolutely. And that's just so exciting, isn't it? Because what it means is that actually if you sit next to somebody in school that's a real, real cynic and is full of questions as to why or whether you would ever want to go to church, actually you can pray for them knowing that actually they too you could be saved. When you walk past somebody in the metro and, and they're there sitting there with their hat out and saying, you know, can I have some money um, uh, because I've come and I've got nothing to live by. Uh, yes, we can actually help their needs, but also that person is reachable with the good news of Jesus. Maybe our neighbours who are being put off, maybe from their childhood or put off by what they think it's about. Actually, there is just nobody that is out of reach. Because the gospel is simple. We are saved, as James says, we are saved by grace through faith. And so it's just really, really important that we hold on to this and think about it. And just affirm it time and time again. Yes, yes, yes. And then as you go through this section, you realise that this isn't just a theory thing. This is not just a bunch of people who've got together in a high room thinking about actually, what do we think, you know, philosophically and theologically we should be saying here? So you see in verse 3, for example, that uh, they recount uh, what's happened in Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of Gentiles. They point to the fact that this is the reality of people's lives. We're seeing them come to faith. They don't have to have anything. They don't need to know anything. They need to have no observation of any of the Jewish world, yet they're still coming to Jesus. So they give a personal testimony of people who come to faith. Uh, in verse 16, you see, uh, when James is justifying the decision, you know, he's, he references the scriptures and says, actually, when we go back and read the scriptures, we can see that it's God's purpose. In verse 18, um, when Peter has obviously had a word and talked about, presumably, um, what happened to him at Cornelius' house, um, which you can read about in chapter 10, he said, it's clearly within God's purposes. so important to read and to understand that it is by grace that we are saved. We come just as we are, with nothing else. We just come. Why is this important? I, I've just written down a couple of things. Uh, it encourages our evangelism. It means that actually there is nobody, but nobody, that we can't talk to. Okay, I'll let it go. <laughs> I won't compete. But actually, how often is it when 
and we we know people and we're frightened about what they might think or we're not quite sure we've got the, the words. There's so, so many excuses on there as to why we would never say anything um, about Jesus to anybody else. But actually, if we see here that anybody, anybody can come to Jesus, then maybe we just need 30 seconds of wild courage to start those conversations. So I think it encourages our evangelism. But also, I think it prioritises our praying. Uh, do you see in verses uh, 8 and 9, where it talks about the, the Holy Spirit at work in, in people's lives? Um, and it, it's so important, of course, because we realise that if it is a gospel of grace, it is about God acting first and foremost in people's uh, hearts and lives. That's what it talks about, about the impact of the Holy Spirit. They've got the Holy Spirit just as we have, verse 9. And therefore, if we recognise that actually what changes people's lives is God's Spirit, then we realise that it's not just our words, but it's our praying. That actually, it's really, really important, in a sense, that we spend the time because if we spend the time praying, then God responds and acts in response to our praying. But also it's hope for our homes too. It, in the sense that it may be just within our own homes, there are people uh, within our own families, the people that don't know Jesus, the people that are not quite sure, they don't know whether they really want to make a commitment, they're just kind of part of a culture that's been going on, and actually encourages that actually if Jesus can reach anyone, it doesn't matter where they are at the moment. It doesn't matter, in a sense, what kind of a life they're living or some of the choices that they're making. That actually there is hope. Because we know that if God can reach into people's hearts, then he can reach into the hearts of those that we love. And that's why we continue to pray. So, question one, who can come to Jesus? Anyone, anyone. Uh, and I think, I, you know, when I read these things, I, I think I'm always just surprised I am too, you know, and it's, it, it's got to do for me, do for anyone. But the second question is, how as a church do we avoid alienating people? How do we stop the if dot 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 graffiti? Uh, and I think the answer is by fully grasping ourselves the gospel of grace. It's really, really easy, isn't it, for people to think that church is full of people who think that they are superior because they need a better life, they make better decisions. Uh, I, I, I remember uh, talking to uh, kind of a friend um, who works in a really, really rough part of uh, Birkenhead um, in the northwest of England. It's, it's an ex-everything. It used to be shipbuilding and steelworks and all the rest of it. It's kind of nothing now and uh, has huge, huge unemployment. Uh, and one of the real challenges um, in that community is that the people that come to faith don't hang around very long because it's a really, really poor community um, and, and a lot of them have drug issues and alcohol issues and it's rampant in that area. And the moment that people come to faith and, and it begins to, uh, to stop, in a sense, some of their addictions and some of their destructive habits, actually they have um, a little bit more money and they have better jobs and so they're actually thinking, we want to not live here anymore and they move away. Um, and it's just interesting because the danger in a community like that is the people that uh, come to faith in Jesus and make really, really good decisions and they're very good decisions end up uh, thinking that somehow they're better than others. Uh, and it's something that we need to really, really guard against. Do I think I'm a better person? Do I think somehow, because I know Jesus, because um, uh, you know, I, I try and live according to the way he does, because I, I pray and I come to church and I, I help and I volunteer with it, does that make me a better person? reminds us that it's God's goodness 
not I. And therefore, absolutely, we need to make right and good and loving decisions, but we mustn't do it in such a way that it makes other people feel that they can't do more. And it's about what we long, isn't it? You know, do we long to have people amongst us who are going to be challenging, who have um, uh, 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 abuse issues, who have substance issues, who have complicated lives? Do we long for those kinds of people to be in our midst? Or do we just want to be nice people, a nice church with uncomplicated friends? Gospel of grace challenges us our sense of goodness or superiority. Or what about our sense of in somehow being um, intellectually great? I've found the truth about Jesus. I've studied, I've read my Bible, I've done it since I was a kid, or uh, actually I, I researched and I look into all kinds of other philosophies and I've come to the conclusion that Christianity is, is true and right. You know, or, or something like C.S. Lewis, I love C.S. Lewis, you know. Um, but you know, he argues that he was intellectually convinced uh, and he was dragged kicking and screaming into the threshold of the kingdom of God because of his intellectual prowess, not because of his heart. Of course, he changed totally um, after his conversion and realised actually how that was such an arrogant view to think that he had found the answer. How many like to think that we know it all because we're clever and we've read the scriptures and we've done other things that we've studied and that therefore actually if you haven't, you can't come to Jesus. Now I'm not saying for one minute that we shouldn't read the scriptures and we shouldn't study and shouldn't actually spend our time learning as much as we can. It's one of the greatest privileges of ordained ministries to be given that time in theological college uh, where you can do nothing but read um, uh, and be in some of the most fantastic libraries, it's great. But let's not convince ourselves that somehow intelligence is a necessity for coming to faith in Christ. I trained at Theological College uh, alongside uh, a guy who had been a milkman. He had, yeah, you can imagine that, how long ago that was, but the way we used to have people who used to take milk to the door. But you know, he had been a real, real, real uh, tearaway, uh, a history of uh, broken family, all kinds of things. He had left school at 14, unable to read. He came to faith in Christ in his early 20s. The first thing he read was the Bible. And there he was by the time he was 30, training to be a pastor. We often make judgments on others, oh, they'll never get it, they'll never understand it. But actually, if it's God's Holy Spirit hooking their heart and bringing them to love Him, actually, let's not think that it's our ability to find the right place in the Bible without using the index that makes us good Christians. Or upbringing. So many people I've heard say to me, oh, of course I wasn't brought up going to church, you know, it's not part of my culture. Do we do it in such a way that actually if you've not been here since the age of two, if you don't know when to stand up and when to sit down and all the rest of it, suddenly, you know, if you've not been part of this, then you're just excluded. But also, there is that sense in which the Gospel of Grace says, even if you've had that, even if this is what you're growing up in now, or even if it's what you've grown up with, and you haven't grasped it, it's not just about the thing that we do as a family, the thing that I've done since I was tiny, but actually it is about a personal relationship because God's Holy Spirit is in your hearts, then we're fooling ourselves. And so when we're honest with ourselves about what it means to be saved by grace through faith, and notice in that way, it's not saved by faith. It's not actually my faith becoming something that means that God, I'm acceptable to God. I'm saved by grace. God's initial action towards me to call me home. If we understand that, then hopefully it'll stop us making the church a place that people want to avoid. And thirdly, 
What about, how can we be harmonious and not hurting as a church? I don't, I don't know whether you, when you heard Adam read that earlier, that you were slightly shocked by the way James ended his account. Let me read it to you again. Um, Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has uh, been strangled and from bloods. Um, so you think, hang on a second. So James is saying, hey, you can come as you are, you don't have to follow any of these rules, but these are the rules you have, and I'm going to ask you to follow. Uh, like, no, hey, what's going on? Let me unpack this for you a little bit, um, and I think um, you, you'll have to trust me on this. Uh, just because some of the words that are used in Greek um, and the context that we know, presumably from some of uh, Paul's writings, particularly to the Corinthian church and the Galatian church, and we know what was going on in the culture of the time, uh, I think there are three issues that he is dealing with. One is about worship. One is about relationships, and one is about eating. That covers the basic place of life, doesn't it? Anyway. So everything else to you other than spend time with us, they work in there. He doesn't touch work, okay. Um, but it's our leisure time. Worship, relationships, eating. Why? Why do you say, um, you know, uh, food offered? Because I think, sorry, what I should say is all of these, I think, are specific things around first century pagan temple. So joining in, joining in in some of those um, meals that would go on, so that worship would be there and there'd be sacrifice and then and there'd be um, there'd be kind of uh, eating um, there. There is uh, temple prostitution. There was a, 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 an engaging in sexual activity it was a regular part of worship, um, and obviously the whole thing about uh, water and how meat is slaughtered and stuff were really significant. But let me help you think why they're important. Firstly, about going to the worship of another place in another place. He's saying, think about where you really belong. Where do you really belong? It's so easy uh, for them to think, yeah, okay, I've come to Jesus. Uh, but actually, I, I can carry on my own lifestyle, I can carry on doing the things I was doing, because I had a really, really good bunch of mates uh, down at the temple, and it was great fun, and, um, you know, let's stop there, um, it was great fun, and I liked being there. And, and I, did, I want to trust in Jesus, but I want to carry on doing those things. It helps us think, doesn't it? Actually, there are so many ways in which um, uh, we want to uh, belong. It's maybe the conversations in the office. Can we remember when you used to go into the office? Yeah, if you can remember that far back, yeah. But the conversations about, you know, actually talking about the things that we've seen or, or things that, you know, and just that wanting to belong. When you're in school, actually wanting to be uh, with the cool kids, not the kids who, oh yeah, yeah, I went to church on Sunday, blah, 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 you know. And it, it's just thinking a little bit about where do you truly belong? Because so many of us can have different personas, particularly when we're younger, different personas. I'm this person here, and I'm that person there, and I'm the other thing there. What James is saying is, if you belong to Jesus, and he has got your heart, how is that lived out for you? Now, I don't imagine looking around, many of us uh, will be going to pagan temples and, uh, you know, and might be having a conversation about whether you should have halal meat from the butchers, that's an interesting one, um, a biblical interpretation, but, you know, but actually we know where we are, but do we? Are there places where you go, conversations that you have, friendships that you're engaged in, that if Jesus were alive and walking with you, you'd hesitate to bring him to you? It's about where you belong, isn't it? Or, or, or what about 
this whole idea of the, the way in which um, you know they were saying, well, I can believe in Jesus, but I'm still going to go to the to the, the temple for the worship and the prostitutes and, and the way that was, because actually a lot of those was also the way in which they ran their lives, and they would have fortune tellers and others who would make them help them make decisions about what they do. And what James is saying is, no, you mustn't actually go to places and follow things that question who is Lord of your life. Don't continue in your old ways. Paul writes elsewhere, you know, if you come to Christ, again, the church in Corinth can really wrestle with this issue, you know, that if you come to Christ, you are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And it's about that transformation of your heart and then working with what Jesus is doing through his Holy Spirit in our lives rather than fighting against it. That's a question, isn't it, for all of us? Do we love him more than we did five years ago or one year ago or a month ago? Have we wanted to know more? Have we wanted to pray more? Have we sought to know actually what Jesus wants of us and not just what everybody else does? That's about our relationship with God, but also with who helps us make decisions. Uh, and the third bit about eating strangled meat, um, uh, and again Paul addresses this again to the Corinthian church, um, he says, you know, actually, it, for the early church it was about fellowship, because they wouldn't sit together. You know, Peter, the reason that the whole argument started was because Basically, Paul said to Peter, look, you, you've had egg with Gentiles, but the moment there's some of the guys from Jerusalem uh, around, you go and sit with them and pretend that you know let's go and sit with the others. And this is actually, it's about the church recognising that there are some things that some of us struggle with, or find hard, or might not accept. But that therefore, we need to make every effort that we can by our lives to not affect others. I think that's what the whole thing about the food was. It's not about whether you do or don't eat um, uh, beef that's done in the slaughter in the right way. It was about table fellowship. Are you doing things that mean it's hard for others to share with you? And I think the reason it's there in the Gospel of Grace passage about how we can come to Jesus and we just, just need to come to him is because there are a number of temptations that we face. One is this, that we want to fit in so much that we come to Jesus but we just do so on Sunday. And at school or work or in our homes we just want to carry on as if Sunday is just a little bit out there. And that's a temptation, no matter how young or old we are. You know, who doesn't want to fit in? Who doesn't want to be loved? Who doesn't want to, to think that actually, you know, people want to be around them? But at what cost? And I think the other temptation it, it is that we're so frightened that we don't want church to be a place that puts people off. And that we're seen to be welcoming and including everybody and it's right and proper that we do, that actually we think that we don't need to be any different and that the church just needs to accept the culture around. And if it accepts the culture around, it will be easy for people to walk in. Of course, that's back to why this whole question was asked. Have we witnessed to the holy gods? Because of course, if there isn't any holiness, then we don't have a problem before God. If we don't have a problem before God, we don't need forgiveness. If we don't need forgiveness, there is no need for the cross, and therefore Jesus died in vain. But actually the Gospel of Grace says there is an issue. And therefore, lovingly and with humility, not because we earn God's favour, but because we have God's grace, he does call us to live differently. He does call us to holiness. He does call us to stand out from the culture of our day that's not good and right, 
and according to the way he wants to live, and for us to be different. Now that is hugely, hugely, hugely challenging. None of us are able to do that well, and that's why we are to encourage one another's struggles and difficulties with humility and love and prayer. That we're never to judge those who fail and to say, as someone said, all they're clearly not a Christian, just because people have struggles. But we mustn't also lose sight of that the gospel of grace requires us to understand actually that God is other. And therefore that we do, once it's touched our lives, need to listen and learn how to live the way God wants us to. So, three things. Is it really for everybody? Absolutely, absolutely. And if if you're not sure in your own heart that you know and love the Lord Jesus, then please don't leave today without actually talking to someone and saying, actually, Help me understand how I can know you all and allow you into my hearts. Are we putting people off? Probably, because we're sinful and weak. But let's make every effort we can to not, to welcome, to value those that are different, to, to want to pray for a church that's full of people who struggle because it's a wonderful sign of the gospel of grace. Uh, and above all, with each other. Let's love each other. Let's understand each other's strengths, and but also pray for each other's weaknesses. Because if we are humble and loving with each other, and do whatever we can for each other, because it brings honour to God, but also makes it easy for people to come. Let me pray, and then I think Patrick's going to continue in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel of grace. We just thank you that. Anyone, anyone, anyone can know you. No one is too far that you cannot reach them. Help to help us to know and understand that more for ourselves, for it to encourage us in the people that we talk to, to have those moments of just bold, daring, and courage to talk of you. And just help us to remember that because you are the God of grace, we need to be people of